Uh, I don't know if I've ever expressed it out loud here in this body uh, or ever really shared this with you, but I'm an enormous fan of C.S. Lewis. How many in the house have read the Narnia Chronicles? Really, fewer than I would have expected. Oh yeah, who's, who's, who saw the movies that have been coming out over the last couple of years? Or, okay, here's the, real, here's the real test. Who saw the old BBC version? Thank you, Judy. Oh, oh yeah, Kelly. Oh, no, Madeline. Those were, those were great classic movies. C.S. Lewis is a, a Christian apologist, and his major mission in life uh, throughout his, his career in writing was to share the good news of Jesus Christ with people who had not otherwise heard it through writing. And especially, he had some really fantastic nonfiction, some really great essays and uh, autobiographies and, and this sort of thing. But I am most deeply moved by his fantasy. He was a very imaginative guy, and he liked to think imaginatively about what it was to be a Christian and what life is like on a sort of metaphorical level. Uh, Narnia Chronicles is his most famous work. Uh, many people have seen the films or uh, read the books. Uh, he has many, many others, some of which I like quite a bit more than Narnia. Narnia is good, don't get me wrong, but there are some fantastic ones. I'm very fond of the screw tape letters, which imagines a, a conversation between two demons trying to tempt human beings. Uh, I'm very fond of the Space Trilogy. He and uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, at one point, agreed together to do uh, two science fiction series. Uh, C.S. Lewis to write one about space and, and Tolkien to write one about time. Tolkien never got around to finishing his. But Lewis uh, wrote a trilogy about, a science fiction trilogy about space, which delights my heart. Uh, but one of his other most famous works uh, takes its name from this passage of scripture, the gospel passage that we did with the kids. It's called The Great Divorce. And it imagines for us what heaven and hell might be like uh, from a reading of scripture that takes seriously human sin, that takes seriously divine imminence and transcendence. It's a fascinating book, and it's coming from this, this line in the Gospel lesson about there being a great chasm fixed between Abraham and Lazarus and the rich man. I recommend it highly. It's an amazing book. It, it talks about human sin in a really intimate way and a way that really blows the rust off of what we think it means to be a Christian. The impact of me reading this book, and on today's gospel, and on the epistle reading, for that matter, for today, is this idea of division, of divorce, of separation. Separation in the afterlife between good and evil. Lewis, in many of his speculative works, cautions us, and rightly, we must not allow ourselves to be trapped in any kind of fascination with mysticism. God vastly prefers a heart that cares for a neighbor than a mind that is absorbed by good and evil and imaginary things or unimaginable things. God cares more for good deeds in this present life than for a good demonology or angelology. And so I'm not going to work today on the fascination of eternal speculation. I am not preaching today about heaven and hell. But I am preaching about good and evil and about rich and poor. In two of our texts today, the scripture actually makes an effort to, if not draw as equal, then at least to parallel those two distinctions, good and evil, poor and rich. It's a funny quirk of English I was working on this morning, that in a list of two parallel things, if you take two parallel things, the way we talk about it in English, we tend to pick and speak the better one the more valuable one first, good and evil, rich and poor, up and down, north and south, tall and short, brothers and sisters. If you think that I'm wrong about this, try saying those backwards. See how it sounds. Evil and good, poor and rich, down and up south and north. It just doesn't roll the same way. We don't think of such things in the same terms. But the two New Testament texts that we read today literally cannot prefer the rich over the poor as our society and our world longs to do. The poor is the focus and is equated with the good. The gentler of the two texts, I feel at least, is the Timothy text. 
Paul here demands not asceticism, not chosen poverty to make a point, but a refusal to chase after wealth as if it is the only thing that matters. It is godliness combined with contentment, Paul says, that is of great gain. And those who long to be rich are overtaken by senseless desires. And my personal favorite from this Paul text, the root of all evils is the love of money. I'm going to say that again. I, I sat down with the Greek to translate this very particularly because I was curious about just what he's saying. The root, it's the same root that gives us the word radish, the root of all evils is the love of money. A note, by the way, on wealth. An important piece of context for talking about the way that Jesus talks about wealth. In this time, at this place, there is no such thing as a middle class. In Jesus' world, there wasn't anything like it. It did not exist. There were two settings. You were either wealthy, and you made your money on the backs of the other people in the world, or you were poor. There were no professionals. There was no middle ground. White-collar jobs were not something that they had. You were either a day laborer or an artisan or a farmer, an impoverished person, with no lasting wealth to be passed on to the next generation. Or you were a wealthy person, a merchant or a noble, someone of substance who made more substance. We hear talk in our society today about the 99% and the 1%. There's a lot more nuance to that in our society. We have a middle class. We have people who do not have to struggle on a daily basis for the necessities of life, but who also are not fabulously wealthy. But in the Bible, they lived in that 1% world. Vast underclasses and ultra-concentrated wealth. It's an important point to bring up because Paul is not denouncing people who were doing okay. People who were getting by. In Paul's time, such people didn't exist. You were either poor or you were wealthy. And so when Paul talks about a wealthy person, he is not talking about someone who's comfortable, someone who's fairly well off. He's not talking about the American dream. He's talking about people who exploit and oppress poor people in order to make vast, vast sums of money. In another sermon, better yet in a Bible study, I'll go into the economics of all of that. But suffice it to say, Paul leaves a lot of wiggle room in this text. He says in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith. Not all, but some. The door is open for some to remain faithful. And at the end of the passage from the letter, there are those who are commended for being wealthy and for being also rich in good deeds and in gifts the poor. But Paul still exhorts us, encourages us to every kind of spiritual good. Shun all this, he says, the material of the world, the wealth and riches, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Against such things, he says in another place, there is no law. Fight the good fight of faith. Every one of those traits is deserving of a sermon unto itself. And Paul's graceful words have this space for being wealthy and for serving well in wealth. But Jesus, Jesus never pulls a punch. Jesus never lets us up off the mat. Jesus always speaks the unvarnished truth. Jesus speaks bluntly about the divine realities of the world. And this parable, I don't have quite as much trouble with this parable as the one that I did last week. Last week's parable I just didn't understand. This week's one, this is just hard and weird. So very different from every other parable I can think of. This is a spiritual story, not a concrete story. Every other parable you can name, you know, there are lamps or seeds or trees or there's something you can point to. A familiar, lively human story. This parable wanders off in this 
flight of fancy about heaven and hell, about Abraham and the great chasm between him and this rich man. It's a spiritual parable, not concrete. It's very, very visceral. I, I try to imagine with the, the rich man lying in torment, try to imagine how he must be suffering that his request is not douse me with water, is not draw me up from this place, but send Lazarus the drop of water on his finger to cool my tongue. I am in agony. Such a small thing to want, and yet so far away. The man burning, the rich man, earns our pity for his suffering and our scorn for his foolishness. But I'm not quite clear why. And the downtrodden, the oppressed, the poor can empathize with the suffering Lazarus, who is not known for doing anything terribly good. I'll admit the confusion of this parable for me. I'll admit that I wish I understood more than he was rich and the other was poor. I wish I understood better what it was that God was getting at with this. Because if I'm reading Timothy correctly, it is possible to be a rich person and a good person. It is possible to be a wealthy person and to be generous and to be giving and to be caring. You can do it. But the only defining characteristic of this man in this parable of Jesus, the only thing we know about him, we do not even know his name. The only thing we know is that he's rich. And a man lying outside his gates is poor. I'm confused by that. I think there must be more nuance to it. And there is. In sitting with these texts and reflecting on them, I came back to my words from last week. The fact that I don't like money personally. I don't like it. I don't like what it does to people. That, the words of Christ from last week, no one serves both God and wealth, and the words of Paul from this week, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Those sing to me, those speak to me, those speak to something deep in me that says, I could be so easily seduced. I could be so easily led astray if I just let myself love money. If I cut loose, if I said, you know what, my neighbors don't matter. My friends don't matter, my family doesn't matter. The only thing that matters to me is making a buck. I could be terrible. I could be the worst kind of evil. And it frightens me. And so I've spent much of my life rejecting the pursuit of money at all costs and decrying it in my brothers and sisters as I see the harm that it does to our society and to our neighbors, to the poor people suffering on the streets. My charge here my command for you from the Lord is not reject all money and go and live in a cave out in the state park and eat locusts and honey. That's not what God is asking of us. What God is asking of us is don't long to be rich. Don't sit around daydreaming hour after hour about winning the lottery and all the things you're going to do when the lotto ticket comes through. Don't scheme and plan and pour all of your resources into acquiring vast wealth. But don't fuss about it too much either. Do your job effectively and well if you have one, and if you don't, get one and do that effectively and well. Receive your pay in gratitude and use it wisely. Save as you think that you will have future need and spend as you have need in the present. And just think less about money. As little as you can get away with, I suggest. Think less about it. I've been reflecting on a, a, a little quote that's attributed to C.S. Lewis. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. 
And I think that's the attitude we need about money. Don't, as I have been prone to do in my error in the past, despise money and hate it. But don't think about it. Put it on the back burner. If you have a choice between sitting down and doing a delicate budget over the next three months and spending time with an ailing neighbor, spend time with your neighbor. Just think less about money. Don't make it the focus of your life. Make it make as your focus is those traits that Paul encourages. Godliness, righteousness, gentleness, constancy. And finally this, and this I think is more my agenda and my hope. Based on this great divorce, this great division that lies not only in the heart of the story of the rich man and Lazarus, but that lies in our society. A great division between the people for whom the acquisition of wealth is their only goal and the people for whom a life well lived is their heart's pursuit. I suggest to you that you spend your money well. If you have a choice between spending your money at a giant corporation, one whose leaders and overseers are more interested in making their investors the maximum profit that they can pull off, or if you can find a small business, a local business, whose owners are getting by, they're making an honest buck, if you can choose between spending your money in either of those two places, spend it locally. Spend it in your community. Spend it amongst your neighbors. Spend your money well. Buy from the locals, the local restaurant, the local deli, the local farm stand, the local manufacturer, the local guy who makes rugs or chairs. Spend your money well. And then don't think about it. Do not let yourself try and serve both God and money. For the love of money, the desire for money, is the root of all kinds of evil. Amen. Our hymn of response is, Be Thou My Vision. I, I, after I had sent out the bulletin information, I had a request, which is apparently the Presbyterian hymnal version skips a verse. And it's a good verse. I like the verse. So we've got 339 in the blue on here. That's incorrect. I'd like you to pull out the old hymnal, Hymns of the Living Church. Yes, remember what number? 344. 344 in Hymns of the Living Church.